Okay, Barada, good morning to everyone. Good to see you. Um, and welcome to our information session on applying for a postdoctoral fellowship through the ESRC Wales Doctoral Training Partnership, the DTP. It's great to have you with us this morning. Um, we've got a fairly focused information session uh, which will introduce you to who we are um, and talk a bit about, uh, you know, what a postdoctoral fellowship involves, uh, the ones that we're uh, supporting this year, um, what it's like to be a postdoctoral fellow, how you apply for it, uh, your relationship to mentors and so on. And we, uh, I will give a presentation on this right now. I'm John Harrington, director of the ESRC Wales Doctoral Training Partnership. And uh, with me, I have a number of our current and past postdoctoral fellows, two of whom will give short presentations about their experiences, um, and the rest of whom will be available to participate in the discussion, really, and share insights and, uh, and experiences. Um, and to answer any questions you have. So this is really very much about encouraging you and informing you and responding to any queries you have about our postdoctoral fellowships. Um, in addition, uh, we've got a colleague who is currently mentoring a postdoctoral fellow, uh, and she will present after our two, after our two fellows whom I have, I have mentioned. So. If you're not familiar with the Wales DTP, we are um, a doctoral training partnership, one of 14 in the United Kingdom, funded by the Economic Social Research Council to fund doctoral studentships and provide doctoral training. Um, and you may be familiar with that, with that work from your own experience. Um, we're made up of six universities, uh, five in Wales and one in England, Aber, Bangor, Cardiff, Cardiff Met, Gloucester and Swansea. And the partnership is made up of 20 thematic pathways. So there are disciplinary and interdisciplinary and run the range of the social sciences, areas like law, journalism, geography, business, psychology and so on. They're all laid out on our home pages and are well worth looking at. Each pathway is led by an academic convener and they're important for this process too. We award 50 doctoral studentships annually, but importantly, we also get funding every year from the ESRC to run a postdoctoral fellowship competition. And we get between seven and 10 uh, funding for seven and 10 fellowships, which we award through a competitive process applying the criteria uh, that are set by the <coughs> excuse me by the ESRC and it's that that I want to talk to you about today that we want to <coughs> showcase to you in our presentation. So what's a postdoctoral fellowship? Well in a way it, it does what it says on the tin it follows on a PhD. It can help you to build an academic career certainly to turn your PhD into publications to do some new research work and publish on that. But also other aspects of the of the academic life I suppose like impact and engagement. Uh, and increasingly the ESRC emphasizes that it's doctoral studentships, but also it's postgraduate fellowships are um, not simply aimed at turning everyone into academics. About 50% of our students, our doctoral students, go on to non-academic careers. And the ESRC is keen that we also encourage people who are thinking about non-academic careers to apply for fellowships. So that's work in government, in industry, in the media, in the professions, and, and so on, and business, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's certainly true here. Uh, the ESRC Wales DGP is committed to diversity and equality. We have a, a working uh, EDI subgroup, which reviews all our processes, including this one. We have a, an active widening participation scheme at a doctoral level, and we encourage uh, applications from all parts of the community. We... Hey, Google. Hello? 
uh, sorry, something just came in there. Uh, we encourage um, not just applications from people of all backgrounds, but also uh, on people doing research on the widest range of, of topics within the social sciences. And we've been actively encouraging our doctoral students, for example, our applicants uh, and our collaborating partners to look at issues uh, to do with EDI in the social sciences like education, psychology, law, and so on that I have been mentioning. And that's really one of the reasons why we're running this event today is to reach out to a wider community beyond uh, people who have established academic networks and may know already about postdoctoral fellowships. Okay, I've talked a little about, about uh, postdocs in general. I have to be quite specific about the ESRC one because it's very specifically focused. First thing is different from other uh, postdocs. It's only one year. In that one year, if you're successful, you'll get a salary, you'll get some additional research funding. But the important thing to emphasize is that the center of this postdoc is turning your PhD into outputs, into a monograph, into articles. That's the core of it. It's not all of it. But in that way, it's different from, say, the Lever Humor British Academy uh, postdocs, which allow you to a longer period of time, three, four years, to launch out on, on a new body of work. This postdoc is quite focused on, on what you've done in your PhD. Now, clearly, an application that only says, I, I'm going to turn my thesis into a book is probably not going to be a strong application. There is also an important element of career development, uh, career development in relation to things like impact in relation to things like engaging with stakeholder communities outside academia. There is also room for some new research, obviously, to complement what's been done in the, in the PhD. There isn't a requirement that everything has to be turned into a monograph. We certainly understand that people may prefer to produce, you know, two, three, four um, um, research papers, reviewed articles and, and so on. But that's, that's certainly at the, at the center of things. So the career development is an important criterion that we look at. We also look at the fit to the host institution and the mentor. I'll say a little more about that in a second. Uh, it's worth looking at our current postdoc fellows. We've got profiles of them on our home pages, which I've, I've mentioned there, uh, to see what kind of work people are doing, what kind of ambitions they have for themselves when they do the postdocs. Okay. Uh, the application process, this is on our, our web pages. We currently have a competition open. Closing date is the 23rd of March. Uh, this year, and you will need, if, if you're interested, to contact the pathway convener who's listed on our website for each of our pathways before the 1st of February coming. So that's quite soon. So if you're interested, I would get going on, on preparing really quite soon um, because it's 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 a significant application. I'll mention something about that. Please look at the eligibility requirements. Uh, if you've got questions on eligibility, the address there, fellowships at Wells DTP, is the address to write to. And our team, Claire Evans, who's with us today, um, Mike Hackman, Carl Baker, and myself, will be able to to help clarify. Um, your application will include a program of activities that should be plausible, should build on your, on your prior work, your PhD work. The activities include outputs, presentations, conferences, uh, impact elements, and so on. So what goes into the application? Well, the thing to say is the application is essentially a funding application to the ESRC. So it's like a grant application. So when you're talking to colleagues like your former supervisor, current supervisor, like your um, uh, uh, potential mentor, uh, you've got to let them know that it's coming in this, in this form. This could be done to the standard and written in this way. So it includes a case for support where you talk about your research, your research ideas, how they're innovative. Uh, you set out your program of activities, as I said, how they relate to career 
developments. The justification of resources, the main resources sought are, are the salary to do the work, but there is scope for additional funding, as I said, and you would have to specify what that's going to be used for attending conferences, if we're able to get to conferences, uh, and other, other, you know, accessing archives and so on. There needs to be a statement for the head of the department that you're looking to go to. So if you want to go to uh, data science in Swansea, then you will need a statement from them. You need a statement from the mentor. The mentor normally, in most cases, is not your former PhD supervisor, it has to be someone else. In some cases, a special case can be made. But normally, we would be looking for you to, to move, really, maybe not institution, that's not required, but certainly a new person. But the mentor is very important. And my colleague, Dr. Lucy Griffiths, will talk to you uh, something about that. Uh, CV, referee statement, and, and a work plan. Okay. Our process for considering applications is in two, you know, we can, well, we can take out three stages, I guess. You've got to get your application together. You've got to get support from the department that you want to go to, support from the, the mentor, as I've mentioned. You apply through the pathway. The pathway will then shortlist. Um, and the, the, uh, shortlisted applications go forward to our management board, which represents all our institutions. The management board meets, uh, we will probably meet uh, just after the spring break um, and decide based on, on the seven of, of awards that we've got from the ESRC, which candidates meet the target and rank them and so on. There may be interviews, uh, that's less likely at the moment. We, we used to run the interviews as standard, but we are looking at simplifying the process. If you are interviewed, please uh, are called for interview. Obviously, please let us know about reasonable adjustments. The university will inform you if you have been successful. Okay, after our uh, presentation, the next three presentations, we will take questions, question and answer. Um, and very much, as I've said, we welcome uh, any any detailed or bigger questions about about the scheme. But for now, we have three people to speak to you: Dr. April Lewis Pennant, uh, who's a current postdoctoral fellow; Dr. Diana Bolliars, who's a former postdoctoral fellow; and Dr. Lucy Griffiths uh, at Swansea University, who's currently mentoring a postdoctoral fellow. So uh, thank you for that. I'm going to pass over now to, to April Louise. Thank you, John. Please, can I share my screen? I think you might have to stop. Uh, I am stopping now. Ah, thank you. Cheers. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So greetings, everyone, um, and thank you to the Wells DTP team for inviting me to share my insights on the ESRC postdoc. As they just said, my name is Dr. Ape Louise Pennant, and I am a current ESRC postdoc at Cardiff University, and I am on the education pathway. And in my 10-minute talk, um, I will briefly share with you the following. Firstly, I'm going to provide you with a brief overview of my education and career timeline. Um, and I guess this should hopefully provide an indication of how I got here. Um, I will then share why I wanted to do an ESRC postdoc, as well as the barriers to applying and how I overcame them. Um, I'll then move on to discussing um, tips for how to put an application together. And I will introduce you to my own project and lastly share my ambitions for the fellowship and beyond. So in terms of my education and career timeline then, um, a whole 10 years ago in 2011, um, I started my undergraduate degree at the University of Kent. And I did a four year course of sociology with a year abroad in Hong Kong. Now, straight after that, um, I got a ESRC one plus three studentship at the University of Birmingham in 2015. And um, 
I completed the master's um, plus one bit in 2016. And then straight after that, um, when I was completing my um, PhD, I hadn't quite finished it yet, but I did get a job in the Welsh government um, in 2019. So I moved to Cardiff and I was involved in um, projects such as the additional learning needs, um, the Race Equality Action Plan, the Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic New Curriculum Working Group and other things when I was working at the Welsh government, which was great. And at that same time, <clears throat> though I had completed and submitted my thesis in September 20. 2019 I didn't finish um, until I might do my virtual viva at the beginning of the lockdowns in March 2020 and um, around this time I decided that I wanted to potentially come back into academia so that's when I applied um, for the postdoc and luckily I was successful and I started in October of 2021 and my project is called understanding to overstand the education system the educational journeys and experiences of black British women graduates and later on I'll talk more about that so in terms of uh, why the ESRC postdoc fellowship, uh, this quote from the great Bell Hooks who recently passed away, may she rest in peace, exemplifies and inspired my reasons to come back to academia. So what she says is the academy is not paradise, but learning is a place where paradise can be created. So for me, completing my PhD was quite a challenge for a number of reasons. Um, and it definitely made me reconsider whether an academic career was for me. Um, but I definitely knew that I wanted to continue um, with the research that I was doing and that I wanted to develop it further. Uh, also, my experience working in the government was um, a great break. And it was a way um, to get other experience as I'd done studying continuously um, since undergrad. Um, and it was also a way to um, make me realize that I missed the intellectual environment and possibilities um, that the academy could offer. And lastly, I thought that, you know, the ESRC postdoc was perfect as it provided uh, a concentrated time, salary, a mentor and resources to build upon my PhD research, which is what I wanted to do. So um, in terms of barriers to applying then, um, Unfortunately, I wasn't able to come to one of these information sessions. Um, so potentially if I had, then maybe I wouldn't have had these same barriers. But um, for me, when I looked at the ESRC postdoc application process, I realized that it was, there was a lot of levels um, and I didn't always quite understand them. Um, for instance, you know, identifying a mentor and a pathway and gaining their support. And also the many different documents that must be completed as part of the application that was kind of a barrier to me um, secondly um, it's definitely a skill to write a strong fellowship application um, because they must be clear and concise but also have enough detail to show that you've really thought it through and you also have to follow uh, the specifications and make sure is that the expected standard so all of that was quite daunting for me um, and this leads to what I think is the most important aspect, which I didn't previously have when I applied for, say, other fellowships, and that is support. Now, this is in terms of getting the right mentor who believes in you and your proposal, but also um, the institutional fit, uh, departmental support as well. And this can help in terms of uh, writing an impressive application. So in terms of how I overcome the barriers then, um, I definitely utilize my researcher skills to look at every inch of the world's DTP postdoc page. I made sure I downloaded and understood the course specification, the frequently answered questions and um, pathways and convener options. Um, then I had to really dedicate a lot of time and effort to write and rewrite and rewrite again my application um, from gaining feedback. Uh, this included weekends after work and also actually taking some time off work and using my holidays to do that. Um, and from the very beginning, I worked very closely with my mentor um, who helped to shape and strengthen my application. And the School of Soxai, which I'm part of, also supported me a great deal because they have like a research um, department. 
And before I submitted my application, it was peer reviewed twice by colleagues um, in the department. So in terms of putting the application together, um, here are some of my tips. Uh, I think that it's so, so important to be clear about what you want to do in the fellowship. Um, as we know, you only have one year. So what outputs do you want to achieve at the end? Knowing this will make it slightly easier when you are completing the application. Another thing is, uh, does your project align with the pathways available? Uh, does it fit with the institution and the department? How and why? These are some of the things that you should consider. And lastly, an ESRC fellowship is very, very competitive. So you need to have written several drafts, potentially had it peer reviewed if you can, um, incorporate some of the feedback from your potential mentor as well as others, and just give yourself enough time, um, which may mean finding extra time to complete it. So in terms of my project then quickly, um, my project is called Understanding to Overstand the Education System, the Educational Journeys and Experiences of Black British Women Graduates. And this follows on from my thesis research about the same topic. And within um, this fellowship, I'm using the time to one, complete a monograph, because um, I would like to turn the thesis into a non-academic book. Um, I'm also want to enhance my teaching practice. So this could be in terms of using more online platforms as well as in a new institution. Um, I would like to also use my time to build networks. As John said, it's quite hard because you know there's COVID right now, but um, I've been making a lot of links here and abroad in terms of people in my area um, and connecting with people doing similar research here and elsewhere. Um, I'm also participating in research training, so my research in my thesis was more qualitative, but I'm going to be um, looking and learning more quantitative um, research methods. And lastly, um, my mentor is the um, creator of the Migration, Ethnicity, Race and Diversity Research Group in Soxai. So one of my roles would be to support her and support the research group in terms of its activities. So in terms of my ambitions for the fellowship, then um, obviously is to complete the objectives that I just shared with you before. Um, I'm also looking at other opportunities to develop my research interests, not just about black women in education, but more generally um, further. Um, I'm also looking and have been building national and international academic networks, and this will be great for um, possible collaborations in my future academic career, because like, yes, I have decided that I would like to have an academic career. Um, and lastly, I'm hoping that all of these um, different ambitions and objectives will enable me to have a successful transition into a full time lectureship, either in Cardiff or elsewhere. So yes, um, short and sweet. Thank you all for listening. And I hope you did find this useful. Um, we're going to have some question and answers after, but you are free to connect with me via my Twitter or my email. And good luck and all the best if you do choose to apply. Jochen Vairo, thank you very much for that. Great stuff. Very helpful. Um, and thank you for taking the time. I'm going to pass straight over to Dr. Diana Belliaris who was one of our postdoctoral fellows in 2019-2020, partly to tell us about her own experience in applying and so on, but particularly what comes after, what comes out of the postdoc. So over to you, Diana. Thank you very much, John. And uh, thank you for everyone who's come to this session. I hope it's very useful. Uh, like uh, Dr. Pan and I didn't have a session like this and I would have, it would have helped me a, a lot. So do take notes, um, I hope it's, uh, it's useful. So um, I'm going to say immediately that I did have a COVID extension. So I did have a one year postdoc plus a five month uh, extra extension to kind of um, help out with the disruption of the pandemic. And um, unfortunately, even that wasn't enough uh, because I was going to do observations in care homes, um, looking at people with dementia. Uh, and working with college students uh, in Garrow College in Swansea for uh, the impact element of my uh, postdoc. And that didn't happen, so I had to reinvent it um, twice. Uh, but that, is, that has happened, uh, and there, there are ways to do that. So um, I'll speak a little bit about that as well. 
Um, I don't have slides, um, so I'll just um, speak a little bit about um, what I did, uh, what my fellowship work was until um, how I did write a, a book, how I, I turned my PhD into a monograph. Um, for those of you who are thinking about that, um, what I'm currently doing and what the plans are. Um, because obviously you, ha you have plans and then things happen and then you have to adjust them. Um, so uh, I did a PhD in human geography at Swansea University. Uh, I wasn't eligible for an ESFC um, uh, doctoral uh, bursary because I'm Dutch and you have to be in the UK for, for three years, uh, but I was eligible for a postdoctoral fellowship, which I did in Swansea, also in human geography. And that was because I did uh, um, a one year um, lectureship preceding the, um, the postdoctoral fellowship. Um, and then the, the Wales DTP very kindly allowed me to start two months later. Uh, but that's, uh, I know that that's uh, quite a um, they had to move heaven and earth to uh, to allow me to do that. So thank you very much still. Um, so the reasons for choosing this uh, this scheme to apply for this scheme, uh, being it being a one year project and not a three year, as John already said, um, I really wanted to have more time to write up my PhD publications, um, including the, the fellowship. I wanted to continue to do social sciences and humanities and if you have a monograph it will help you um, gain that mandate and help you be become more competitive so that's, um, that's one of the reasons why I, I wrote the monograph um, and it helped me prepare for uh, a research project um, of three years or, or longer and become more competitive as such. And I cannot emphasize um, more what Dr. Pennant said um, the, the process of applying for this fellowship is incredibly time consuming. Um, there's so many forms you have to fill in. And if you, have, if you change one thing in one form, you have to go through all the other forms to make sure that, they're, that everything's in line. So do not underestimate it. Um, I, I did underestimate it and I um, slept less as a result of it. Um, so so do, not, uh, do not underestimate it. Um, it's a great preparation, though, because you you are made to think through all the little aspects that you might not have th thought of before, uh, to, and, and it will prepare you better for the, the post-op itself. So um, regarding the work I did on the fellowship, um, during my PhD, I kind of um, wrote a skeletal um, um, a theory, uh, which um, was based on Tourette syndrome, and I wanted to expand it to another pathology with this one year um, fellowship. Uh, so I could then uh, expand it further to beyond pathology uh, in, a, in, a, in a larger uh, PhD or a larger postdoctoral um, um, uh, project uh, after this one. Um, and that's still the plan, but it has. Uh, uh, has been interrupted a little bit. Um, so I did opt for the 25% extra research time, um, which I then had to change a little bit. Um, um, but moving on from that project, um, I, I, the main reason, as I said, to get on this fellowship was to write a book and um, turn this into a monograph within an accessible Form, so not a, a report style work, which was uh, the form of my PhD, but also make it as accessible for a broader audience, uh, like Dr. Bennon said, to, to have it read by non-academics as well. And I hope I succeeded in that. Uh, also, it allowed me to kind of solve some problems and attend to sloppiness um, that I had um, in, in my PhD project. So, and, and improve the quality of the writing, obviously. I'm glad I did it because it's it's a very cool publication to have, especially um, because my publisher Routledge uh, allowed me to keep the audio rights production, so I can um, make an audio book out of it and not have to uh, pay Routledge for it. But I found it quite a struggle because it's it's one year and you have to and the, and the writing a monograph is such a big thing. Also, I, I struggled with writing it in isolation in the pandemic as I lived alone. Um, 
a mind that publishing books takes longer than a year if you're thinking about it um, I'm sure you write faster than me but you have to write a proposal and getting the contract can easily spread out over about four months and after submitting the manuscript you're not done uh, because you're waiting another at least five months of going through the production stages with the editorial assistance. Um, so do take this into account if you're planning for your job after your fellowship. So by all means, do write the book, do write this into uh, into your application. Just know that after your fellowship stops, you're going to have to um, still have some to work on it. So if you're moving on to another full-time job, um, uh, like I did, um, it means that you have to organize for it. So I'm working in the evenings and weekends as well at the moment, um, despite my line manager being quite lenient so far. Um, so going back to the scheme, it definitely does what it says on LinkedIn. It sets you up very well for a research career because it also allowed me to develop all the collaborations that I wanted to and more. Um, so that is just, that's fantastic. But then the, in terms of the plans, the disruption, um, I currently, I'm currently on a, a three-year horizon EU project, a uh, research officer. Um, so I'm also doing 100% uh, research at the moment, uh, also in Swansea. And my contract is two years, possibly two and a half. Um, it, it is on COVID actually, so there's no escape uh, for me at all. Um, um, and because I'm now a research officer in this big consortium uh, uh, and uh, I'm the lowest ranking um, um, team member of our team, um, it's, uh, it's a, a different experience as, as I had with the fellowship, because with the fellowship you're in charge, you're making all the decisions, uh, and you can kind of follow on uh, if you if you're if you're excited by something you can follow on uh, onto that. And at the moment that's not the case for me. So doing this project um, obviously is fantastic, and I'm very lucky to have it. Uh, at the same time, I'm really struggling to keep all my collaborations going that I set up during the fellowship. Um, um, so that's not a drawback. That's um, not. It's just that's just something you have to manage, and I didn't really foresee that uh, such um, when I signed the contract for this project. Um, weirdly enough, perhaps. Um, um, let's see. Yes, so I'm um, still currently following up on the extra research project and impact um, part of the um, my. Um, postdoctoral fellowship that I couldn't do and um, I've been able to set up um, a working collaboration with the Dementia Research Center of UCL and I'm going to do a secondary analysis of the data of one of their projects and this has been postponed, 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 postponed um, because I have to come in and, and they're not always allowing um, visitors. So if you have, if you cannot uh, collect your own data. There is data available um, um, on the uh, UK Data Archive, uh, I think it's called. So do have a, a look around as well uh, on that if, you, if you're struggling with uh, the pandemic consequences of not being able to go anywhere. Um, so I'm currently in this uh, COVID project, but I'm also still trying to get uh, a Leave Hume Early Career Fellowship and I've kept my net network outside of Swansea University warm to um, uh, to opt for a Welcome Trust uh, Early Career Fellowship because I have two, um, um, two starting dates or two application dates uh, further on into the year. So that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. Um, so yeah, so if you have any questions, if you want to see my application um, files or anything else, um, please do get in touch. Um, I'm on Twitter as well, and, um, uh, and on the Swansea University webpage. Um, so do not hesitate to get in touch. I'm happy to share anything too. So um, yeah, if you have any questions, please let me know in the Q&A. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Diana. That's brilliant. Really great to have that um, experience shared with uh, potential applicants. That's that's very interesting what's followed on and your adaptation to COVID and to a certain extent, the opportunities that, that came out of it. I would just pick up on a point you raised for the, you know, the benefit of the audience. I sit on the management board that, that decides uh, at the final stage. Uh, and we're looking, obviously, for ambitious projects. We're also, however, looking for feasible projects. And we know that it's only one year. So uh, a strong application will, will get a balance between this, will we'll build out of the core strengths of the, of the PhD. And as you've said, and as you successfully did, build out of the, the thesis to, to work on publications, other networks and impacts and career development, but without over-promising. And now clearly, as, as you said, and as everyone's experience over the last two years, there are unforeseen events which make, which change what is feasible. We, we, we do take that into account as well, but it's a balance. This is only a one year fellowship and it's interesting and great that you're looking at follow on uh, fellowships and, and, and sources like the ECR scheme at Leverhulme and, uh, and the welcome. I will, uh, so, Thank you again, Diana. I'll pass you. I'll pass the, the audience now on to uh, Dr. Lucy Griffiths, who's at Swansea University, and Lucy is currently mentoring one of our postdoctoral fellows, um, Emily Mar Dr. Emily Marchant. Uh, Lucy is also the pathway lead for our interdisciplinary data science health and well-being pathway. So it's great to have you, Lucy. Thanks again for making the time. And I will pass over to you now. Thanks, John. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for that introduction, John. So I, um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to talk to you just for a couple of minutes. I don't have any slides, but talk to you about the role of the mentor um, and I come, you know, to this role as as pathway convener, but also involved um, now in currently mentoring Emily, but also involved in a number of other um, mentoring schemes across the UK or within academia. So um, your application requires you to have a mentor principally to, um, you know, to help you develop as an early career researcher. It's a really important distinction. It's very different, as you can imagine, from your PhD supervisor or your line manager. So there's no line of accountability. This is kind of the you know the principal point, really. Um, so you know your conversations are um, a, you know should be a lot freer. They should be about sort of really encouraging you and helping you to 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 grow and develop. Um, so the mentor helps the mentee to discover. You know their own wisdom and to do things for themselves but of course their expertise can be accessed. So the mentor should be someone uh, more experienced in their relevant field and um, they should um, allow the fellow to enhance you know their learning um, but also to uh, perhaps um, help them to make other contacts within the academic um, academic field to help them, you know, widen their networks. Um, so they will assist when putting together the, your application and supporting you throughout your fellowship, but you really do need to demonstrate that you are um, the one that's actively managing your own development within your application. So the first point of call, I think, is to, as John mentioned, is to speak to um, the convener in the relevant pathway that you wish to apply to. And they will certainly, if you don't have a mentor in mind, they will help you, um, uh, perhaps help you find one. Um, and again, ideally, as previously mentioned, this should not be your PhD supervisor, as you really need to sort of during this, you know, one year period, um, it's really a time for you uh, and opportunity for you to focus on your own independence as an ECR. Um, it is possible to have a second mentor. Um, so Emily Marchant's on the call, um, has, um, she has a second one. Uh, so she also has Tom Crick, who's a professor of digital education and policy. Um, so he brings that kind of expertise in terms of from the education field. I'm a health epidemiologist and Emily's research 
stems both health and education. So for her, it works really well um, to have both of us. So she enjoys that bargain of two for the price of one. Emily, is there anything else you wanted to say on that particular point at the moment? No, but just really to encourage you that if you do have sort of interdisciplinary research interests to really take advantage of being able to have two mentors, um, because I think it really adds value to both your application and hopefully if you're successful, your, your research, your postdoctoral fellowship. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. And, and so your mentor is really signing up for, you know, between one and two hours contact time every week. Um, and if required, um, funding can be provided for this support. Um, so during the application process, so sorry, there's a question in the, about the, whether the second mentor can be your PhD supervisor. I mean, I think, I think technically it can, can't it, John, really, but we could, um, John, did you want to come back? On that? that would be an exceptional case. Yeah. I think the, the, it, it's great to have a second one for all the reasons you mentioned, Lucy and Emily did, uh, but the, 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 the approach to the SRC is, is by and large to have a new mentor and if it's a second mentor to, for them not to be the PhD supervisor. An exceptional case can be made, but it would have to be made. Yeah. Um, so your mentors will support you, you know, with your application and help you strengthen that. And also the primary mentor then provides that letter of support, which is you know, called the mentoring statement and also um, uh, provides a CV. Uh, if you do have a second mentor, then um, their role should just be covered in the primary mentor statement, but they also need to provide a CV. Um, so throughout the actual process, they will the mentors or mentors will advise on, um, you know, on your progress, guide you in achieving your aims and the activities, and also you know providing advice on your future career opportunities. Um, so my advice is really to make really make the most of, of that time that you have with them during that one year period and and generally also learning um, about that kind of relationship between mentor mentee and there's there's lots of resources available my, my go to site is usually the Academy of Medical Sciences they really have some great in depth information about that um, that may help um, so good luck to you all I hope that was helpful. Thanks very much, Lucy. Yeah, exceptionally helpful, I think. Um, I would say, just to add, the relationship, the capacity, the focus of the mentor and their fit to the project and what they're going to bring to it is something we look at on the management board when we're deciding the, the, the final application. And it, it you know, it's, it's not the whole of it, clearly. They, we're talking about the intellectual core earlier. Nonetheless, it can make a significant difference to the, the strength of the application. Um, they will be happy to answer questions now. If you want to put them in the chat box or pop your hand up, uh, we can bring you in. Um, please feel free uh, right now. If, if not, I will, I will ask any of them to come in and, and if they want to add from their experience, uh, that would also be great. But first of all, anyone with any questions? <laughs> 